Happy Mother's Day, uh, moms, in our lives. Uh, this was from a very unofficial and very unscientific survey taken of some children. They were asked a few questions. One question they were asked was, why did God make mothers? Why did God make mothers? One answer was, she's the only one who knows where the scotch tape is. <laughs> another, answer, another answer from a child was, to help us get out of there when we were getting born. Uh, another, another question they were asked is, what ingredients are mothers made of? What ingredients are mothers made of? One answer was, God makes mothers out of clouds and angel hair and everything nice in the world and one dab of mean. <laughs> another answer was, they had to get their start from men's bones, so I guess they used mostly string, I guess. Okay. <laughs> what kind of little girl was your mom? What kind of little girl was your mom? My mom has always been my mom, and none of that other stuff. That was probably a boy, if I had to guess. Another answer to that question was, I don't know because I wasn't there, but my guess would be pretty bossy. <laughs> and this one, my favorite answer, they say she used to be nice. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, it gets better. Trust me. These aren't even dad jokes. This is where it gets really good. Another question asked the children was, what did mom need to know about dad before she married him? Well, one answer was his last name. <laughs> Fair. Uh, she had to know his background. Like, is he a crook? Does he get drunk on beer? <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, my, and this, one, this, was, this is my favorite. <laughs> this is my absolute favorite answer. <clears throat> Does he make at least $800 a year? Did he say no to drugs and yes to chores? <laughs> I like that answer. Okay, okay, last one. Why did, God, uh, why did mom marry your dad? Why did mom marry your dad? One answer was, my dad makes the best spaghetti in the world, and my mom eats a lot. <laughs> and then this one. Love the practicality. Well, she got too old to do anything else with him. You know, it's interesting that we, we, we get to laugh every now and again. Usually we laugh on Father's Day, and we like to laugh on Mother's Day too because we don't want anyone taking themselves too seriously. But survey after survey and study after study shows that regardless of religious or political affiliation, get this, nearly 90% of women believe motherhood is the best thing that ever happened to them. Nearly 90%. And yet at the same time, 71% of all mothers believe Motherhood is incredibly stressful. I love that. It's, it's both. You know, sometimes the most worthwhile things in life are the hardest. And that, that's what I can see when I see that stat. And yet, we live in a culture and a time when increasingly we tell women to bypass that thing that's going to be what their own studies show is the most significant and best thing that ever happened to them. We tell them to raise a family later, get married later. We tell them to go get careers, get self-sustaining. Nothing's wrong with any of that. But then mental health professionals come back and say that the process is making women more miserable and making them more depressed at higher rates than any other time in history. But that stands to reason when nearly 90% of women who have all those things will say motherhood is still the best thing that ever happened to them. So why the disconnect? Why can't we just kind of get both of those things right? You can decide on your own culturally why we might be that way. But we want to celebrate what M-O-M -M means, what mom means. And I've always wanted to do a Mother's Day message about Mary, the mother of Jesus. I always have, and, and I never have until today. And I'm excited about this because Mary was a tour de force. She's raising the Son of God. You might think that was easy. I'm going to point out that that was a lot harder than we sometimes give her credit for. And I got the acrostic for MOM from a message by uh, Dr. Barry Davis back in the early 2000s. I took his acrostic and gave it my spin because I loved what he did with the meaning of MOM. And he starts off first reminding us, and this is where I'll take off, uh, that mom means model. Mom means model, that she is a model of faith. She is a model of what it means to be a human, but also be a successful disciple of Jesus. Mary knew stress. She knew what stress was. She was not immune to stress just because she was raising Jesus. She knew what that meant. But whereas some Christian groups make too much of Mary, and they make her almost into like a goddess, we evangelicals sometimes go the other way. We make too little out of her. 
But this was a faithful woman of God long before Jesus came along. We read this whenever the angel Gabriel appeared to her and told her she was going to become pregnant and she was going to give birth to a son and he, he was going to be the savior of the world, the son of God. She says this in response to that in Luke chapter 1 verse 38. I am the Lord's servant. May your word be fulfilled to me. And then the angel left her. Now, to be an unwed mother in her, her frame, her time frame, was essentially a death sentence. She could have been executed for this. She was engaged at the time to a man named Joseph, and he could have divorced her. So, I mean, there was not a good way to get out of this one. This was going to be rough no matter what, and her response was, may it happen just as you said. She was already faithful. She was already loyal to the Lord. She was already modeling the faith, and Jesus wasn't even born yet. And then in verse 47, just a few verses down, she says, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. And yet she was facing a very stressful situation. She was facing now having to deal with Joseph, her parents, presumably his parents, her culture, her extended family, everything that her world knew, and somehow they were going to have to believe that she was a virgin and pregnant. Oh, and by the way, that baby was the son of God, and yet she says, my soul rejoices in God, my Savior. What a model of faith. Gals, you got this. You can, do, you can model the faith even under tremendous stress because it's not about getting rid of the stress in your life. It's about where you focus your eyes on while you're going through it. Mary wasn't immune to that just because she was bearing the Son of God. She still had to deal with that. But mom also means optimist. Optimist. You know, mental attitude is, is kind of a make or break for moms. I have figured that out watching my own wife navigate this journey. Mental attitude is everything, but also your mental attitude towards your children affects them into the future. I, I've often heard it said that children are like arrows that you're launching into the future. And so your attitude towards them it will, is, will be what equips them for the future. Your belief in them. You know, Mary believed in Jesus. Yes, a Savior, but she believed in him like a mama would believe in a son. She believed in her son. She believed in her firstborn. She, she believed he could do anything. I mean, he was God and he could, so she was actually right in that case. But she was optimistic about him. And every now and again in the Gospels in the New Testament, the Gospels is a collective term for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament. And in the Gospels, every now and again, you see this mother-son interaction come out and you see just Mary, the person, kind of jumping into the middle of the scene. We have one of those in John chapter 2. John chapter 2, 1 through 5, we have this scene when Mary, the mother, talks to her firstborn son. It says this, On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now, there's a ton I could unpack in that one little passage. Here's what we do know to catch up a little bit with Jewish history. Somehow Mary was involved in this wedding feast, this ceremony. It was like the reception, to put it in our terms. To run out of wine at the party was a serious social faux pas. I mean, it could get you like outcast in your culture. It was a big deal. Like basically the parents of the, of, the bra, of the groom had one job and that was to make sure the wine and food kept flowing. And they ran out and Mary knows there's a problem. Mary goes to Jesus, her firstborn, and goes, we got a problem. They run out of wine. Now you know how moms do that thing where like they hint towards the solution? Like, hey, um, these toys aren't going to pick up themselves. We all know that's a sign to pick up the toys. Okay, that's what Mary was doing to Jesus. You've noticed they've run out of wine, right? And then now his response to her when he says, woman, now if I had, now being raised by a southern woman in Texas, if I had called my mother woman, I would still have no face in the middle of next week when she got done with me. You don't call a southern lady woman to her face. But it's a little different in Jewish culture, Jesus' response to her was curt, but it was not disrespectful. He was, he was reminding her, okay, the mother is not going to force the Son of God to do something. 
And so he responds, Mother, my hour has not yet come yet. And then by faith, this optimist looks to the servants and says, look, I know what he just said, but whatever he tells you to do, do that. She knew he was going to do something. And he did. Read the rest of the story in John 2. His first public miracle was just to keep the party going. And she was an optimist. Ladies, your being optimistic can make your children's future, even when you don't quite believe it yourself. I was a really rough junior hire. I know that comes as a shock to so many, because I'm just such an angelic person today. I know. <laughs> but I, why are you laughing? But I was, I was really rough. I mean, I wasn't, oh, yeah, I was pretty rough as a junior hire. I was really disrespectful. But I really thought I was going to be a band director when I got out of college and all this stuff. And my mom sat down and took me through all these brochures. That was pre-internet, so everything was in print. All these brochures for colleges. She said, okay, if you do that, you're going to have to go through you know, this education. You've got to get a teaching certificate because she was a teacher. So she said, you're going to have to go through all this. And she, she sat down. She believed I could do it. And then when the Lord called me to ministry in high school, once he had fixed me out of junior high and he called me to ministry in high school, my mom sat back down and said, okay, let's pull out those brochures. Let's look back at this. What does it change? She believed in what the Lord was doing in me. That, that, opti- that optimism in your children's life, ladies, is huge. Never underestimate your ability to impact their lives, even if you're not 100% sold on it. I don't, my mom says she always believed in me, but I don't know if that was the truth when I was in junior high. I'll be really honest. I don't know, but she says it is, and I'm not calling my mama a liar. That's as bad as calling her woman, so I'm not going to do that. But mom means optimist. Also, mom means mainstay. Mainstay. We, we don't use mainstay a whole lot in the English language, but it is an English word. Mainstay means this. It's a person or thing that acts as a chief support or part. Like we might say agriculture is the mainstay of the Central Valley or technology is the mainstay of California. It's also a nautical term referring to the support from the main mast of a ship. So literally you couldn't sail a sailboat without a mainstay. And doesn't that just describe a mom so well? I mean, we all make the joke, at least most people I know tend to make this joke, we would all be dead if it wasn't for our mothers saying, don't do that. Don't jump off the roof of the house. You cannot survive this fall without breaking your leg. You're going to break your neck. How many times do moms say that? We we would all be dead if it wasn't for our mothers. But also just their faith in our lives, the, the, the faith you can give to your children, being that mainstay. Mary was a mainstay in Jesus' life. Well, one reason I love the series The Chosen so much is it shows this human relationship between Mary and Jesus. It shows the mother, because sometimes we just want her to be so perfect that we can't relate to her, or we want her to be so incredibly human that we forget that this was a champion of faith long before Jesus ever came on the scene. But we have another one of these scenes where we see the mom and the son when Jesus is actually on the cross. And in John 19, 25, it says this, 25 through 27. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Now we know that that was John, the author of the Gospel of John. That Jesus on the cross, paying the price for our sin, looks down and he takes care of his mom. And he gives that curt, but not necessarily disrespectful thing where he goes, now the Son of God is talking. Your provision is now in John. Church history tells us that she died at a very old age in the home of John in Ephesus. Because John took care of her. And you know, I I wasn't there at the crucifixion. and, And I'm not a woman. And I would be a very ugly woman. But I'm not a woman. And, and there's nothing I can do to become a woman, so I can't, I, I will never know how Mary felt, but I do at least have the ability to imagine as much as I can as a dad what it must have been like for Mary at the crucifixion. This was the Son of God. Yeah, true. This was her baby. This was her firstborn This was the one the angel prophesied about. This was the one she told Joseph about. This was the one she held in her arms. This was her baby that she nursed. She taught him how to use a spoon. She changed his diaper. She taught him how to clothe himself. She she taught him how to speak. 
She was there when he scraped his knee and she was the one that kissed it and made it all better. She was the one person on the face of the earth for all time that little boy Jesus would look up to her with those deep brown eyes and black hair and olive skin and he'd look at her and say, Ima, I love you, Ima. And she's watching him die. I don't know how she felt and I don't know, the Bible doesn't say this part, but I would imagine she stayed there until he drew his last breath, until her baby needed her no more. And then he's put in the tomb, he rises from the dead, 40 days later the ascension happens, now we're on the day of Pentecost, it's the birthday of the church. Scripture says all these disciples are gathered together in this upper room waiting for the arrival of the Holy Spirit. And then you have this little tag in Acts chapter 1, verse 14. Most people read it so fast when you go through your daily Bible reading that you just kind of skip over this. Why don't you check this out? Jesus is off the scene now. He's back in heaven. They, being all these disciples, join together constantly in prayer along with the women and, she singled out here, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. See, Scripture tells us in a few spots that Mary and Joseph had other children. These other children didn't believe in Jesus as the Messiah. But after the resurrection, they did. We actually have one of their writings in the New Testament, the son of Joseph and Mary. That'd be Jesus' half-brother. It's the book of James in the New Testament. He grew up with Jesus, but didn't believe in him until after the resurrection. But Mary was there. And I I can't prove it in the Bible, but looking at her life, I would imagine those brothers and sisters of Jesus believed in him as much because of her as Jesus, that it was her witness, it was her testimony, it was her saying, no, I know where he came from. I was there when the angel gave me the message. I, 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 I can't prove it, I can't prove it in the Bible, but I just can't help but think to look at her life that she did that, that she was a spiritual mom to the early church that she was the spiritual mom that blessed others and would tell that story over and over and over again. You know, they didn't celebrate Christmas the way we did. That's a few centuries after Mary's time. But I do wonder if people ever came up and said, Mary, tell us, tell us again what the angel said. Tell us what you heard that night Jesus was born. What was it like to see him alive again? I mean, that was his mom. Wouldn't you want to know that? And she, at this point in her life, in her older years, had now become a spiritual mom to all these early believers. And that is the impact of a mainstay in faith. Ladies, that is a gift you give to us even today. Your faithfulness to the Lord is a testimony to us and inspires us, your spiritual moms. That's why we make such a big deal on Mother's Day to acknowledge those physical and biological moms, you know, the ones that give birth to us, but also those foster moms and those folks, but even the spiritual moms, because we need you. Man, the early church needed Mary, and she filled that role, and we need you. We have the honor today of blessing these MOMs in our lives, blessing these moms. For you, for you physical, biological moms, you can do this, and you can rock this. I mean, we we'll oftentimes use this language of, you know, it takes a village, and we want to be part of that, but I'll make sure you understand something. Moms, we're not in any way trying to imply you can't do this. You moms have been rocking this mother and thing for a long time. God made you to do this. He created you to do this. We guys can't. You can do this. You got this, and you can rock this. I, I would suggest never question your ability to raise your children. Question any system that makes you doubt it. God made you for this, and and we're so grateful for what you have done in our lives. You can do this, and we're cheering you on, especially as guys, because goodness knows we sure can't. We can't be moms. We need you. Spiritual moms, you get that role of being that M-O-M in our lives. Maybe you're not connected to us biologically. Maybe you didn't adopt us, but boy, you can spiritually adopt us, and we have so many. I'm looking out in this congregation, and I'm looking at so many of these spiritual moms And I even see some of you looking around like saying, yeah, that's one. And yeah, yeah, thank you for being a spiritual mom. Thank you for for loving us, for taking that place, for filling it. We have so many uh, ladies who function like spiritual moms in our children's ministry, in our student ministry. What a gift you're giving to the next generation to be that mainstay in their life. But on a real practical note, I want to encourage everyone to write a note of thanks to these women. You give flowers to people while they're still alive and able to enjoy them. You know, tell them thank you. You say, Joel, I'm not great with words. Look, just saying thank you 
is powerful. Just to say that, to write that. I'm a big fan of writing because something, it takes time to write something. And you don't know, maybe, maybe it's a spiritual mom, you don't know her address. Drop it off in our office, we'll find a way to give it to her. Or you just walk up and just put it in her hand. Okay, you can do that too. But write a note of thanks to those moms. And if your mom is still around, call your mother today and say thanks for being my mom. Thanks for bringing me into the world. Whatever you want to say, just bless those moms in our lives, physical, biological, spiritual. And I want to close the message today with a blessing that we've been reading for many years now. It's written by Amy Young back in 2012. She first wrote this, and it just went viral. It just took the world by storm. And if this is your first year to ever hear this, when I get to the end, I think you'll know why we like it so much. And if you've heard this one every year since we've been doing it, I think around about year six or something like that of reading this, maybe year five, we mean it just as much today as we meant it the first time. To those who gave birth this year with their first child, we celebrate with you. To those who lost a child this year, we mourn with you. To those who are in the trenches with little ones every day and wear the badge of food stains, we appreciate you. To those who experienced loss through miscarriage, failed adoptions, or running away, we mourn with you. To those who walk the hard path of infertility, fraught with pokes, prods, tears, and disappointment, we walk with you. Forgive us when we say foolish things. We don't mean to make this harder than it is. To those who are foster moms, mentor moms, and spiritual moms, we need you. To those who have warm and close relationships with your children, we celebrate with you. To those who have disappointment, heartache, and distance with your children, we sit with you. To those who lost their mothers this year, we grieve with you. To those who experienced abuse at the hands of your own mother, we acknowledge your experience, for there are no words. To those who lived through driving tests, medical tests, and the overall testing of motherhood, we are better for having you in our midst. To those who have aborted children, we remember them and you on this day. To those who are single and long to be married, and long to be mothering children of your own, we mourn that life has not turned out the way you long for it to be. To those who step-parent, we walk with you on that complex path. To those who envisioned lavishing love on grandchildren, yet that dream was not meant to be, we grieve with you. To those who have emptier nest in the coming year, we grieve and rejoice with you. To those who have placed children up for adoption, we commend you for your selflessness and we remember how you hold that child in your heart. And to those who are pregnant with new life, both expected and surprising, we anticipate with you. This Mother's Day, we walk with you. Mothering is not for the faint of heart. And we have some real warriors in our midst. Today, we remember you. We celebrate you. We're grateful for you. Happy Mother's Day.